welcome, welcome followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin. Welcome to episode number one of I Am Not a Number. And this is our weekly review show of The Prisoner. And I am happy to be joined by Tracy Torme and Captain Cockney Spock, my co-host. Greetings, gentlemen. Hello. Hello, Gil. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you, sir. And hail to the edge of time. Hail, edge of time. From the edge of time. Mm. It's always a good place to have greetings from. Yes. (laughs) So we're going to talk the prisoner. And I wanted to start by uh, mentioning that the prisoner is now available to be viewed on Amazon Prime for free in the United States anyway. And this is the newly remastered version of the prisoner. With their IMDB going, of course. Mm. Season one, episode one. (laughs) Yes. Arrival. So it looks fantastic. It sounds great. It's really amazing. And of course, this is the legendary opening. Guys, uh, am I supposed to be seeing this on my screen? I'm seeing it. I'm not sure why you're not. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything. So I'll just play along and pretend that I am, but I can't I see what you guys are seeing. Not being seen. Yeah, that's a shame. Let me try again. Where is the video in the village? I don't know why it's whacked out hmm. it's been taken dun 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 <laughs> man in black at work hmm. <laughs> very strange anyway hmm. there you go now you can see that but it looks great it sounds great and anybody that wants cool. to watch our new show I am not a number where we're going to be Weekly reviewing the show and strongly uh, can follow along uh, <laughs> on Amazon for free. So that's very cool. Good stuff. So, uh, another thing that I wanted to ask Tracy about because Tracy is one of the world's foremost authorities on the prisoner. Um, what's your perfumed viewing order? There are a lot of different people out there that talk about viewing yes. orders different from the, the broadcast schedule. What are your thoughts? Crazy. Can you still hear me? TK421 on 421. Okay, I can hear my English friend here, but I don't think I can hear Gil. You can't uh, hear me. I can hear now the I Cardinal. Can. I could, oh, there we go. Okay. Now I can. So my yeah, question to can. Tracy is... Right, about the, or, the what order. What is your perfumed viewing order? Um, because there are a lot me, of people out there that talk about orders different from the broadcast order. Right. For me, all that's really important is obviously that the arrival episode, the first episode, is obviously first because it sets up the whole show. And mm-hmm. then, of course, the two part, the two part final episode has to be the final episode. As far mm-hmm. as all the ones in between, you know, I think it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I, I don't really well know said. what the big con- <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Six of one. No pun. No pun intended. Um, I don't really know what the big controversy is about other than 
some were shown, you know, a week or two ahead of others in the middle of the season. But unless there's something I'm not really aware of, I don't think that was very important. Just I, having the arrival first and the two part or last. That's what really matters. I think that's really interesting because that in itself is an opinion. We had this on my channel yesterday that everyone agrees that mm. obviously we must have the bookend, must start with arrival, must end with the two part mm. conclusion. But someone was saying mm -hmm. it does beyond that, it doesn't matter. And then we concluded, well, I guess it doesn't matter is in itself an opinion because some people say, mm -hmm. well, it does matter and it's this order. So to them, rightly or wrongly, I'm just playing devil's advocate, rightly or wrongly, for those that say it must be this order, to them, it does matter. So, yeah, it doesn't matter is in itself a, a, a valid opinion. It's like, yeah, go wild mm -hmm. and uh, do your own combo. It's, it's not a continuing mm -hmm. storyline there. Uh, they're basically mm -hmm. uh, bottle episodes. Is that the right term? It's a serial, not a mm -hmm. series. No, it's a series, not a serial. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but for example, uh, when it was broadcast mm -hmm. uh, in Channel 4 in the UK uh, in the early 1980s, circa 82, which is my first introduction to it, uh, even mm -hmm. then there was a controversy because halfway through the, the you know, Back in the old days, before the interwebs, we just had television, you know, you'll watch what we say when we say it. Uh, halfway through, actually, and I think it was in Radio Times or the TV Times, there was a, a letters page controversy. You're broadcasting them in the wrong order, are we? So <laughs> just the fact that there was a wrong order to begin with suggests that there is also a right order. But so that maybe they were just trying to follow the existing filmed order, but then failing to do so. So already from my first exposure to it, uh, you know, as a kid, it was like, wow, there's a certain order and apparently it's wrong. So I've been confused from the beginning. So this is uh, mm -hmm. definitely for me a really valid question. So I'm fascinated to hear that. I'll, after all that, doesn't matter. It's an important we, one because we, uh, we want to make sure that we're reviewing the episodes in the order in which they should be viewed. Certainly, if you view, right. if we view a different one each week, and we all come back and review a different episode, <laughs> I guess that's not going to work. So yeah, Michael Beacom we... says the broadcast order is not the correct order of events. Ah, which mm. tends to suggest that there is a correct order. So already we've got controversy. Is there is there even a correct order? Does it even exist? It does. There you go. <laughs> see controversy from the outset. Brilliant. This is what we want. And Yvette <laughs> Devoyle. Uh, good friend from the UK says, I've been to the village where the prisoner was filmed. They even have mm -hmm. a big white ball there for the tourists. LOL. Wow. That's great. To go there. So they have a, a, a Rover, but maybe not a working one. If I can digress for a second, guys. Uh, yeah. This order, this order thing was very close to home with me because when we were, Tracy is frozen. Oh, can you start oh, no. over, Tracy? We okay. lost you. Yes. I was saying, when we did the series Sliders, we ended the first season with a cliffhanger where someone, one of the main characters, is seemingly shot at the very end of, the, of it. And when we came back for the second season, the network had decided, well, that really didn't matter. No one really pays attention to it. So they had <laughs> wanted us to do an episode where we don't even address it. Everyone's fine. No one's been shot. Who cares? So I started really, really losing my temper and complaining about it, which helped to earn me the well-earned reputation with the network of being, quote, unquote, difficult. And I just Frankie said, you can't do Ryder. it. Yeah. You can't do it. And so they finally compromised with me. They let us shoot like a five-minute insert at the beginning of the second season where we somewhat address what happened at the end of the first season, but it was a tremendous effort just to get them to do that because they didn't care and they didn't seem to think anyone else would care. And so if prisoner fans feel it's sort of a sign of disrespect when it's shown out of order, I can relate to that. Because right. it means they care. I think so. Yeah, yes. That, that that's key. Yeah, that's the thing about mm -hmm. a lot of shows. Basically, internal, canonical, very similitude. It's amazing that a lot 
in a lot of cases, unfortunately, the fans care more about the internal logic of a show than the actual showrunners do. And that's always very telling. It's true, but it's great that there are fans that care about that because, you know, that that's what sort of started the whole Star Trek fandom was people got very serious and caring about all the little details in the show. And why would anyone ever complain about that? That's, you know, that's nirvana for anyone that works on a show that there's a fan base that cares. And that's especially yes. true in the days before the internet, you know, where it wasn't just so easy to to get on and discuss different things. In those days, there was a real um, co controversy in America about whether, you know, some of the network guys realize that the fans do really take it seriously and care for it. It's oh, a yeah. shame that we have to, it's a shame that we have to uh, try to convince them of that. You'd think it was obvious, right. but unfortunately and, it's uh, not. Yeah. Tracy, uh, Slider's fan blog is here and says that episode was Into the Mystic, season two premiere. Very good. You know your stuff. It's absolutely right. By the way, that episode was named after my favorite Van Morrison song. Um, oh, uh, cool. People don't know, but yeah, love that song. So, yeah. But you're and absolutely right. Michael Beacom says, it's not disrespect, it's just incorrect. Note that each episode is mostly standalone, but there is a progression of the prisoner's relation with the village. Wow. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. So what are we going to, are we going to, I mean, I already uh, known unknown is the order that uh, you're going to have on the Amazon list going to match the order that I've got on the back of my DVD. In theory, they're both the official order, but I'm just out of curiosity. They might already disagree with each other, let alone, for example, the Clobby list, or as you've mentioned, Cardinal, the RMB list. So we've really got at least three lists to contend with of the correct viewing order, not to mention anything that might come up in the chat. Which is one of the reasons I wanted to ask Tracy about his preferred viewing order. His preferred, his preferred preferred. <laughs> preferred, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We know, uh, we know what you meant. Brian Hepburn's yeah, let's, move, let's not draw attention to it. We watched it in a different order here from Scott Apel on KTEH 54 PBS. He would show his order and then would do broadcast order every couple of years in between. Mm. Wow. So yes, I'd like it's to an ask important you, topic. I'd like to, ask, I'd like to ask you guys a question. Um, I've found myself that over the last, I don't know, five or ten years, I often find the prisoner is not remembered or appreciated in many circles nearly as much as it should be. But obviously, mm -hmm. because we're doing this show. There is still, you know, a group of people who are, are devoted to it. But I wanted to ask you guys that. Do you feel like it's a forgotten show or do you feel like it's getting revered more as time goes on? Personally, not at all. I think it's still very much part of the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. um, as is mentioned here by Michael Beacom, Robert Meyer Burnett, and uh, Nerdrotic, actually it was as from Heels versus Babyface, went through the series and presented observations from the episodes to prove the point. And they had their mm. own viewing order. Well, I certainly so, hope you're right because it, it's a show that really uh, gets better like fine wine with time. But my worry is that it's not promoted in any way here in America, as far as I know. There was uh, a bunch of things on PBS for a while mm -hmm. where they did a show called The Psychology of the Prisoner with a shrink and his dog sitting next to the screen and analyzing the show every week. Did you guys see that? But uh, other than that, uh, I haven't seen anything really about it in quite a while, but maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. Well, on YouTube, there's been quite a bit of interest in The Prisoner, especially since the digitally remastered versions came out. They look incredible. They sound great. They're remastered in 5.1 surround sound and right. uh, 1080p, and they look like they were made yesterday. I mean, they're just brilliant. Great. And That's uh, good to hear. The, the important thing, I think, is that the, the fans are still talking about it 
and the YouTube content creators like Captain Cockney Spock and myself are keeping it alive and turning the next generation, so to speak, on to the show Good. by yep. great having hear. these weekly review shows. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah, good. Good news. And the edge of time says the Kickstarter for the toys did really well. So demand exists. Mm. Mm, that's good. That's good to hear. And Michael Beacom says the show is criminally underrepresented, especially mm. since to my horror, it's more relevant to the day to day life today than ever. Boy, that Absolutely. is so true. As so true. And in knowing we're going to be doing this show, I've been thinking a lot about that. I think that, you know, Patrick McGowan would have just nodded his head <laughs> knowingly at some of the things that are going on these days. Yeah. I mean, he really predicted the future, what, 60 years, 55 years mm -hmm. ahead of time? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. I, uh, I guess it's going to show my age, unfortunately, but I remember the first time I saw the show and exactly where I was and how it impacted me. Um, I was, you know, very young, but uh, it's a memory I still have of the, the when it appeared on CBS, I guess, um, as a summer replacement um, oh, here in the United right. States. Yeah. I remember you and, telling uh, me about that. We had heard that it was coming on, and we had heard that it was something unusual, highly unusual, and we were familiar with a lot of Patrick McGowan's work, my family was at the time, so we were actually looking forward to it, but we had really no idea what to expect, and when it first came on, uh, I saw it in the summer, if I'm correct in my memory, we were in Las Vegas for two weeks, way back then. And it, it, it came on and it just blew us away because so much of television in, in that time, and I guess still to this day, is so homogenized and so insipid and, uh, and uh, timid. That's the word I would yeah. use. Yeah, and that was just, not the prisoner in any way. A lot of way. TV today is just garbage. Yep. Mm -hmm. Vanilla as fuck. Compared mm -hmm. to the prisoner, right. uh, modern television and the woke uh movement uh -huh. as it were is uh is just it's not even storytelling and you're this is something right. that we discussed with tracy um when we were talking about uh the continuation of sliders that's coming up is that it will never be woke <laughs> i promise you that <laughs> and that's uh my in my dying my, day, uh, I will make that promise. My co-host for Masters of the Genre, PJ from Orville Nation, wanted me to ask you not only uh, to obviously to get a time to reschedule so that we can get that show, but he also asked me if you would be interested in having Mark Scott Zakri on the show. Yeah, I haven't seen Mark in a long, long time. Uh, it's interesting, my history with him, we never actually worked together at Sliders because I had left by the time he came on, but I knew him well, um, because I'm a huge Twilight Zone fan and I had mm -hmm. loved his work on the Twilight Zone book. And also he yeah. had actually written me a re really nice letter after we did a show called the big goodbye on Star Trek. He wrote a long letter to me and, uh, I saw his name at the bottom of the letter. And I thought, wait a minute, this is the guy that wrote the Twilight Zone book. And later, by well, coincidence, it's companion, yeah. Uh, the Twilight Zone Companion is one of my favorite books. Yeah, you, I lost you guys there for a minute. Can you hear me again? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Audio is, is so. Okay, good. So Mark ended up on Sliders as a, I guess, a staff writer on Sliders. I'm not sure if he was a producer or not. I think he was but the I never showrunner. Actually, no, I don't think that's true, unless it's something no. I don't know. 
but who, why would I know? Cause I left, but, yeah. uh, you know, um, he, the job he did on Twilight Zone book was wonderful because I sort of used it as a reference book, um, from time to time. I think I sort of know every Twilight Zone episode, but sometimes one will come on and I'll say, God, I really don't know this one that well, but yeah. Mark had them all in there, you know, and, uh, and so he did a great job in that. Yes, I would love to to see and talk to Mark again. That's the oh, okay, shorter great. answer to that question. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, we'll make sure and bring him on. Great. Uh, when we reschedule Masters of the Genre. Sounds good. And uh, I I know this isn't the the right uh, time for that, but we do have questions. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Zarp asks uh, if you're looking to work with any streaming services for the new sliders is this a reboot or a revival of some sort of imagination of the two sorry oh, amalgamation of the two. Huh. that's an interesting distinction uh yeah it, it's a reboot i would say um you know i'm not supposed to give too much away of what we're working on but i can tell you it's uh it's an interesting mix of the original characters and a couple of new characters and reasons for why they all look 20, 25 years older than previously. There's, it actually has worked into the story. And, uh, and those hideous Cro-Mags will not be uh, taking place nearly as much anymore. I couldn't stand that after a while myself. And- yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> But that was really a place where it was so misused and misunderstood why they were even in the series in the first place. Um, but uh, yes, the answer to that, I'm, my answers are a little meandering today, but my answer would be yes, it's mostly what I would consider a reboot. Good. Nice distinction. Yeah. Hmm. And also PJ has been doing a complete rewatch of the entire series of sliders. Hmm. So oh, wow. when we do reschedule, he's going to be, you know, ready to go. Well, promise you won't uh, blame me for the fourth and fifth seasons. Okay. No, he, we'll he actually friends. mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It got pretty horrible. And the, there's a book recently that said there has never been a series that jumped the shark more than sliders. And I, I could not agree more. Uh, yeah. Game of Thrones says, hold my beer or hold my coffee. <laughs> uh, Sebastian Frost, uh, Fossey says, bring back sliders, Tracy. Nice. And we're, Red we're Wallace trying. Thank you. Says, could Tracy touch on his work for Carnival and his thoughts on the series? I wish it went another few years. And I also wish it went a few more years. What can you tell thank us you about for Carnival? That. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Uh, I love talking about Carnival. Uh, I think it's one of the most underrated series of all time. Uh, fascinating to work on, fascinating to be around, kind of daunting when I joined the, the staff, because I think I was like the only new guy on the staff for the second season. Everyone else who had been there for a year, and they all knew all the ins and outs of the show, and I just, you know, I had not seen the show, believe it or not. And so I oh, really? radically, oh yeah, I, I radically took a bunch of tapes home and steamed through the first season as fast as I could with my wife and uh, fell in love with it and then became really good friends with Dan Knopf, the creator of it. And uh, so I ended up writing three of them, but I was a producer on the whole second season. And, uh, I'm really proud of that show. I really liked it and I really wish it had gone on. There was a lot of interesting things being planned for the future Carnival episodes. The biggest problem was two things, I think. Number one, it was very expensive because you can't do a show about a traveling carnival in the 1930s and do it right unless you're going to spend some money. So right. it was expensive, you know? And the second thing was we were in a pretty constant battle with the network from beginning to end. They never seemed to really want to get behind the show. 
There were always other HBO shows that were beginning or coming on soon that they seemed to be behind. And they never really totally got behind Carnival. So when we got canceled after the season two, we were very disappointed, but we weren't surprised. Um, and I hope that answers your question. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's I, too, I think it's that too, it deserved at least a movie to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. That would have been great. HBO could have easily done a two hour film, you know. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was the weird because fan it, blog mentions yeah i see so many on twitter every week wanting sliders to come back and that's very true well that continues to amaze me because the fact that people were willing to stay with the show uh after the way we ended up where the show just deteriorated in every way over the last you know at least two two and a half seasons uh the writing got sloppy, the producing got sloppy, the continuity was terrible. Sometimes I would turn it on briefly and I'd find continuity mistakes that should be, you know, the most... Uh, well, let's, let's try and stick to the prisoner because that's, that's our topic for today anyway. Um, yeah, it's not just... And by the way... Can you still hear me? The, artwork yes yes all the artwork that we're um, showing has been done by my friend fet for hire and uh this is the background that we'll be using when we do the review every week mm, great i don't know if you guys and could hear the end of what i was saying there but no, um can you, you go ahead okay i was just gonna say that the bottom line is the fact that there are still any sliders fans and i know there's plenty of them Lots. that stuck with the, that stuck with the show despite what was being handed to them over the last few years just absolutely amazes me and i'm also very grateful for it that people could stick with it through all that um hard to believe but i see all the time on the internet that there are very faithful loyal fans to the show and it just kind of hurts me that we didn't service them the properly, but you know, it's history now. So maybe if we do the reboot, we can make up for it. Uh, Michael Beacom says at Tracy Torme, I think most of my friends and I kind of act like the last two seasons didn't happen. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's very smart. I wish, I wish I could do that. That's like a Jedi mind trick there, I guess. Well, that's actually the way I think of it, too. A lot of mm -hmm. us talk about headcanon on yes. YouTube. Yes, headcanon versus we, canon. Yeah, the things that we think are canon at, versus the things that we just don't really consider to be canon. A great example would be Star Wars. The sequel trilogy we do not consider to be canon. But this is key, yeah. not because of headcanon, because on our channel, we, we, we uh, reluctantly reject headcanon. Because if, if we all get into headcanon, then you've broken fiction. There's no more suspension of disbelief. That's you a good point. The, yeah, because if once we've all yeah. got headcanon, then there's internal canonical various similitudes out the window. Is Descartes a replicant? Well, I think he's a Cylon. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my headcanon. You've got to mm -hmm. have a central belief in the story. That, that is suspension of disbelief. So uh, we've concluded that uh, Star Wars, the Disney tragedy, isn't canon, not because of headcanon, because it actually isn't canon. It was neither written nor approved by George Lucas. It is right. mm. subpar fan fiction. It's not even fan fiction. Mm. They're not even fans. It's, uh, it's hate fiction at that. In fact, it's a hate crime. Mm. It's not, it's not <laughs> canon. It's a hate crime. There you go. Mm -hmm. I'll just and it. I, well, and I think that people feel the same way about the last two seasons of Sliders. Mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, it back really to the prisoner. Right. Um and of course Edge of Time and Michael Beacom agree quite. So at least with the prisoner it's closed. There weren't any other seasons it couldn't jump the shark. Whatever anyone Correct. might think of the ending, it's mm -hmm. it's all wrapped up, it's there in a nutshell, isn't it? So I, I think the Magoo and uh 
I think that McGowan insisted that they only do 17 from everything I've heard. Um, mm -hmm. They were trying to offer him a lot of money to expand it. And I talked to him about this. I know we're going to get into that later, but that's one of the things that I spoke with him about was, was he ever tempted to do more episodes so he could stretch out what he was trying to say? And he absolutely told me 100% no, that he was uh, reluctant to even get it up to 17, that he would have rather done something like 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he definitely didn't want to do more. Um, I think it exhausted him making that series. It's definitely something I remember him telling me. Red Walrus says, I've never seen the unbroadcast Western episode Living in Harmony until a few years mm -hmm. ago. It was like finding right. a lost original series Star Trek episode. Right. I agree. That was interesting. It was just a totally unseen episode. I think there was some reason that I can't remember right now, but one of one of you guys might know uh, why it was originally pulled from the order and was not shown for a while. Do you, you guys know why that was? I used to know that. No, I, don't. I think we, we had it in the UK, so it wasn't pulled. So no, I don't. Yeah, it was pulled in the US for some reason. And God, guys, I used to know the answer to that. Haven't thought about it in a long time. So right now it's not coming to me. They but don't I'm like sure someone out on Basically, on yes. American TV, they don't like cowboys. No, that can't be it. <laughs> I think it. That might be I it. think it had to do with the budget, because mm -hmm. it's easy for the BBC. That was BBC, right? Uh, it was out on Channel Four in the UK, but Channel uh, Four. That, yeah, it's Which it's easy to do a Western episode because all that stuff's already, you know, in costuming it's easy to to make facades of buildings and stuff like that i'm sure someone in the audience will know the answer to this but as i recall in the back of my mind there was something controversial about the episode not in the uk necessarily michael but Beacon in the US says there. living in harmony that was during vietnam it was very controversial mm. oh. okay that makes sense yeah there was something about it there was a specific thing in it that had the network guys decide to pull it. And I used to know the answer, but I'm sure someone out there knows. Maybe it was just Vietnam, but I think there was something else to it. Wish I could remember. See, Here's by the power, the by the power of the psychology. Living in Harmony. I'm going to be, yeah. The one I want to see most of all now is living in harmony. What's the problem exactly. with it? <laughs> yeah. It, there was a stigma attached to it, as I recall, that people were aware that it had been pulled. And then when it finally aired in some delayed basis, I don't remember exactly what it was, but when it finally aired, everyone was kind of excited to see sort of the banned prisoner episode. And uh, someone out there definitely knows the answer. Maybe it was Vietnam, but I think it was something a little more finite than that. But who knows? Actually, Maybe I'm wrong. now that I think about it, it may have to do with sort of a, an allegory about the violence of war and the effect of the stigma like you called it on western culture especially in the united states because the united states was very heavily involved in the vietnam war and it could have been uh sort of a uh metaphorical episode relating to yeah. vietnam thank goodness the age of uh, unpopular foreign wars is over eh? <laughs> Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, Edge man. of Time says, being a Western, they argue, the network banned the episode in fear that it carried with it a message against the U.S. presence in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam, Vietnam War being at its height. Is, is that a theory, or are you saying 
It's that's according to the Internet Movie Database. Okay. Because there was so much controversy about the war at that time that doing something anti-Vietnam War wouldn't seem very uh, much to upset the apple cart in those days. But who knows? You know, you never know what the networks are up to. Um, it's an interesting question because now I'm going to be thinking about this when I'm tossing and turning and I try to get to sleep, what was it about living in harmony? And maybe the answers we've gotten so far are absolutely right. Um, Another but, really good point is brought up by Michael Beacom, who says the prisoner was a conscientious objector, as it were, which connects to flower power and the anti nom protesters and anti-violence cowboy shame. Hmm. Hmm. Well, you mentioned, uh, Gil, that it was something was allegorical about it. And that's one thing I think we should all agree on is that the, the prisoner is the king of allegorical shows of all time, in my opinion. Absolutely. There are allegories on, allegories on basically every episode. Absolutely. And I'd like to go ahead, Tracy, and ask you to tell us everything. Spill the beans about your two-hour conversation with Patrick McGowan, how it happened, and just roll. It's all yours. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, that's one of the great highlights of my life, to be honest with you, uh, not overstating it. Um, the way it all came about, I had a, an office at Universal Studios for a couple of years, and I had a great assistant there. Uh, named Fran Redwine, and she had worked on Columbo for several years. Somewhere she overheard me saying what an influence the prisoner had been to me. She probably overheard a phone conversation or something. And she came in one day and said, I know you, I heard you say you were such a prisoner fan. Would you like to meet Patrick McGowan? I said, are, are you kidding? You know, would I like to meet a beetle? Yes. Oops. So um, she said she would set it up. And then I sort of thought it's one of those things that might or might not happen. Fran was busy with other things. And all of a sudden, one day, she walked in to my office. We had an adjoining office. And she had a Cheshire cat smile on her face. And she said, there's someone on the phone that wants to say hi to you. I had no idea who it was because I, you know, connect the dots. And I picked up the phone and it was Patrick, right? And uh, I was immediately very intimidated in my own mind because I'd heard that he was difficult. I'd heard that he you couldn't be more difficult than he was. I'd heard that he was a really hard drinker. I'd heard that, you know, you just don't know what to expect with him. And, and I was of really course, worried. More Catholic than the Pope. Yeah, that's true. That's why he turned down James Bond. So yeah. uh, I remember being very, very careful, like the first 10 minutes, thinking that any minute here, he's going to say, got to go. Nice talking to you. Click. And I didn't really want that to happen. And I really remember the first like 10 or 15 minutes being very cordial and nice, but. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, cold, but he was not, I wouldn't say he was warm. And it took a while until I think he realized through the conversation, not only what a fan of the show I was, but how hopefully I, I knew the show, not compared to some of the people that are aficionados today, probably. Gil, you were too kind about me knowing the show that well, but, um, I showed him over time how much I did know about the show. And then he really started to warm up. And I remember talking to him at great length about an episode called The Schizoid Man. And I think that was the episode that really cemented me when I was a kid to falling in love with the show. It remains my favorite episode. I named a Star Trek episode after it as an homage. 99% of people didn't even know that, but they didn't know what I it did. was about. But yeah, <laughs> sure you did. But uh, <laughs> so 
we talked and talked and there were several phone calls that came in and Fran would stick her head in the door and say, so-and-so is on the phone. I said, no, no, no. Tell them I'll call them back. And by the time we finished talking, I would say it was about a two hour conversation. And he was so gracious over the last half of it. Um, he let me ask him all the questions I could think of about the show, about things I had heard about the show. Um, I think the reason that he was so open with me and so kind to spend all that time with me, um, I thought about it later. I think he was kind of a fan of my dad's. I think also Fran had probably put in a good word to him. My stepmother at the time was an English actress who had done a lot of movies. And I think he had met her somewhere in the past. So we kind of schmoozed about that. And I think that warmed him up a bit. But the thing I wish I could, I mean, I, I would have given anything now to have taped the conversation if I, you know, that ability to do it. I didn't even think about it. But um, I wish I could, you know, have all the highlights of what he said. But he, you know, basically agreed that he had been so fed up with the way society was heading and he had really come to the conclusion when he was doing his you know previous series which was i guess secret agent man in the u.s danger man in the uk um he had started to have these this philosophy and these theories about the unfortunate direction that society was going in and as you know, this will be no surprise to anyone. He talked a lot that day about his fear that the individual in our society was being destroyed bit by bit. And pretty soon it was going to be like a crime to be an individual. And he would kind of chuckle and talk about the dehumanizing uh, effect of things as simple as social security numbers and uh turning people into their their numbers Various. obviously instead of their names right and he had had sort of the basic idea for the prisoner and he never thought it would get made he never thought anyone would have the guts to make it and what he told me was that this guy sir lou grade i'm sure you guys have heard of um he came to him wanting to produce another series of Secret Agent Man slash Danger Man shows. Great show. And he was at, right. And he was at after Patrick to do it over and over. And Patrick finally got fed up with turning him down and said, I won't do that anymore. Can you get that through your head? I'm done with that. But if you want to do a real interesting show, I've got this idea. Got to warn you, it's it's not, you know, very ordinary. You might hate it. And that's how we first started telling Lou Grade about The Prisoner. And he eventually worked out a compromise where he finally agreed to do it if it was very limited. And it would just have one short sort of half a season. And then that would be it. But Patrick told me, he started chuckling and telling me he knows how these people, meaning like producers, work. And he knew that there would be pressure on him eventually to expand to the show. Right. Yeah. And that would be the sort of the double-edged sword. If the show was successful, they'd be on my back to do more and more of them. So Patrick told me that he went into the series very excited because he was able to explore ideas that he never thought would be explored on TV. But at the same time, he was kind of dreading it. And he told me it was, I'm, I mean, I'm picturing the way he said this right now in my head. He said that uh, he knew it might be an albatross around his neck ultimately. And then he laughed and said, you know, if I was lucky enough to be successful with it, then I would be the unluckiest man in the world because it would be my millstone and it would 
forced me to do exactly what I did not want to do. And I asked him, why were you so against doing a lot of episodes if it was popular? And he said, well, that's just it. If you if the show's going to be any good, it can't be very long because sooner or later you're going to start repeating yourself over and over even if you try not to. That's what you're going to do. And he said, uh, your dad's a songwriter and he goes, I can think of it in terms of songwriters. Don't they always start fiddling with a guitar or a piano and they think they're on to something great? And then it turns out, where have I heard that before? I just came up with a great new riff. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm stealing it from the Stones or I'm stealing it from this or that. And he said the same thing happens in television even more, where even if you're desperately trying not to do it, you repeat yourself over and over and then diminish the whole project. So he said and he was absolutely. I think the last two episodes or seasons of Sliders are a direct correlation to what he was talking about. Yeah, well, that, that may be. And uh, he, he just said that uh, even expanding it, I think, to 17 was something that he was absolutely resistant to do. And he fought it as much as he could, but ultimately he caved in. And I, he also talked about how the series in general really drained him and he once the show started to get this sort of avant-garde reputation he felt a bigger pressure to keep elevating the show and doing good new things but ultimately he was sort of having this internal internal battle with himself that he wanted to make it good and keep it going but he also felt the longer you go the worse it's going to get that was like a theory that he was absolutely, con you know, convicted to, if that's the right word. And uh, so the most amazing thing was um, when we finished up, you know, I was so grateful to him. And we had talked for nearly two hours. And then the, maybe the bittersweet part of this whole story, I never saw or talked to him again after that. I don't think that he lived that much longer as I recall, but I kind of felt like what had happened with him was better than anything I could have dreamed and why spoil it even by trying to do it again. So I yeah, never really, pursued. it sounds like he kind of waltzed in oh, and someone's just waltzed out, waltzed out. Yeah, exactly. Just, perfect, as if just uh, to prove a point, <laughs> perfect example. Please and stand by while we have some tech. While issues. we're waiting, I'd like to mention that uh, a good friend of mine and fifth wife of Philip K. Dick is here, Tessa B. Dick, who is a great writer in her own right and helped Philip K. Dick finish Vallis and A Scanner Darkly. That so, is. greetings, Tessa. Greetings. Is Deckard a replicant? No, just kidding. Not now. We'll talk about it later. I know, uh, obviously, Captain Cockney Spock is a big fan of Philip K. Dick's work. Indeed. As yep. am I. Indeed. Especially Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, but among others. We can remember for it for you wholesale. Interesting about the, uh, uh, the right length of a creative uh, endeavor, whether it's a, a book or a TV show or a song, because it can go the other way. Because arguably Game of Thrones finished too early. It's like uh, Dave and Dan were burnt out, but everyone wanted to keep going, including George. So you've got to have your show the right length, or your book, or your album. Hence, I guess, second album syndrome, fifth season it's a syndrome. Very good point. I mean, yeah, one of my favorite bands is Devo. There's the T-shirt right there, Devolution. And um, on top of it. It, it's it's a good point that sort of the longer a band goes and they've been going since 1974 or maybe even before that right. uh, it it changes it becomes different and so Patrick Magoon probably had a really good point that keep it short and sweet and don't spoil it yeah 
or whatever the right yeah, yeah, the, the right length is because obviously it was his idea that came to him so uh if, if 17 was already overcooking it it's short short for some long for others but uh it should be up to uh the creator same thing Absolutely. with star wars you see once you yeah once you once you've done your story once you're done that's it game over is he on the phone now has there been a technical error it's not Big Brother again. It's not. Is it no. you, NSA? I told you, I'm NSA. Just we've paid the bills. I was letting you vamp while I. Thank you. Hello to our good friends in the National Security Agency, who I hope are not going to be interfering with the show this time. And Tessa says, "I'm blushing." Nice, a blush response. Excellent. It's almost like we've done a live uh, Voight Kampf test. And Tessa says that her favorite Philip K. Dick novel is Radio Free Albemuth. Oh, interesting. And it's one of my favorites as well. Okay. It's hard to to pick a favorite because there's so many good stories, short stories. Yeah. It's different different concepts, different ideas, sometimes yeah. not comparable to each other. Apples and oranges. Indeed. It's like comparing Vallis's to Albemuth's. And indeed, and Scanner then Darkly. A Scanner Darkly. Yeah. Great movie, by the way. The book isn't the movie, but great movie. Yeah. I agree. But for example, I think uh, it was done just the right way. Yeah. Per I think one a perfect movie for me. Yeah. Well done, Richard Linklater. But yeah, it's uh, hard to pick a favorite. In fact, shout out to uh, my good friend out there, uh, Captain Kiwi Kirk, who's a massive Philip K. Dick fan. And his personal favorite is Vallis. He reckons that is the high watermark, but uh, and and Tessa helped Philip K. Dick finish Vallis. She so wrote some go. of it, so we're happy to have her here. Yeah, that's perfect. Her, we are says, honored. Yes, very much so. And while we're waiting for uh, Tracy to come back and regale us with further tales of the prisoner i wanted right. to read something from the wikipedia about the alternative versions and it says alternative versions of two episodes exist and have never uh, sorry have been commercially released an early edit of arrival with a different music score and different dialogue and oh. scenes not in the broadcast version was located in the 2000s and released to DVD in the UK and in 2009 in the A&E home video DVD and Blu-ray box sets. This alternative version was located on a near pristine 35 millimeter print and has been transferred in high definition along with the 17 episodes for the Blu-ray release, which I have. An early edit of The Chimes of Big Ben Again, with an unbroadcast music score and additional scenes and dialogue not in the broadcast version, was located in the 1980s and initially released on the VHS videotape by MPI Home Video, which I've also seen. It was later included as a bonus feature on the A&E Home Video DVD release of the series in the early 2000s. In 2009, it was also included in the expanded A&E home video box set, but owing to the low quality of the print, it was not upgraded to high definition, as was Arrival, and was instead included as a bonus on the set's standard DVD extras disc, which was included in both the DVD and the Blu-ray versions, which I have. And then it goes DVD on about episode viewing order. But first, let's talk about that. Okay, before the main topic, the viewing order. Well, alternative versions, again, it uh, goes back to that main topic, canonical verisimilitude. If you've got two versions of a dialogue, which one is the one that took place? So obviously we'll go, if they contradict each other, we have to go with the final edit. But then that begs the question, what was wrong with the original dialogue? Why did they change it? What did it say that was so different? Who's on the phone? Is it the President of the United States again? Tell him we're busy. 
Meanwhile, yeah, uh, to, but with the, going back to the uh, the viewing order, because uh, Star Wars is no different, it's no better, is it? Nobody knows the right order to watch Star Wars, including George Lucas. Indeed, for most people, it's an unknown unknown. They don't even know that they don't know the right order or that there isn't a set and order. Like I was saying before about headcanon, and you made a very yes. good point about the difference between canon and headcanon. Thank you. In the viewing order of Star Wars... Some people include Rogue One. Some people include um, Solo the Lost last Chocolate. of the the prequels, uh, yeah. the Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, and you know some people put that in their viewing order, and that's I think it's yes. really interesting to watch those films in a different order and see the way that you know different reveals pleases you the most right one person said for instance that uh they were turning i think their spouse or their significant other on to star wars and yeah. made sure to show it in an order where the no luke i am your father was a surprise no, and I am your father. Well, yes, because if you watch them one, two, three, four, five, six, you go like, well, I knew that already. Clearly, look, that's where he gets Padme pregnant before he force, force chokes her to death and then wonders why she's dead. Indeed. But then if you watch it the other way, you don't get the Yoda. Well, yeah, for the Yoda reveal. Yoda. Well, of course it's Yoda. I saw him. And, a, and Darius Munchausen yeah. says four, five, one, two, three, six. That's Five pretty much the corner. The connoisseur's choice, or even I'll go one further four, five, two, three, six, just ditch one. But then that speaks to your point does shuffling the order include the right to subtract and add episodes? So, quite right, but yeah, exactly. if we weren't allowed to subtract, then yeah, four, five, one, two, three, six, definitely. I mean, one, two, edge three, of time four, five, makes six, a good nine. point. C3PO and the Uncle Owen memory wipe is head canon. Uh, it's actual official canon. They did have a sexual affair. Absolute fact. 3PO, Uncle Owen, back <laughs> of the moisture evaporator. 12 years of homoerotic adventures between men and, and droid. Aunt Bruce, she had no memory clue. Memory wiped. Memory wiped. But Uncle Owen, he was stoic. But he knew the whole time. But in his head, he was going he like, did. 3PO, I can't believe it's you. What are the odds if you're coming back randomly to the place of your birth or indeed creation by none other than Darth Vader? Oh, 3PO, yeah. the furtive rumblings we had be around it the back of the It was something that was really poorly did, done in the, in the film. Yeah, but this is why order is important. And so anyone going, well, obviously it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, really? Tell that to the people of 1977. If we're all waiting for episode one, then he never had the money to make it because we had to watch four, five, and six to give him the money to make one, two, three. So it's clearly mm -hmm. not. One, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, imagine George Lucas at school doing the alphabet. George, could you read out the alphabet? Sure, teach. D, E, F, D, Y, A, B, X, C, yeah. G, H, I, X, Y, Z. So let me continue with yes. the viewing order. And we have so Tracy key. Torme back. He's back. Or at least his the screen's back. The screen is back. H. Only the host can see you. The host may add you go. to the broadcast. There you are. You're on the show. Boom. Guys, can you hear me? Well, oh, there you go. We sure can. I don't, know, I don't know where it cut off, so I'm not sure what you guys heard. Uh, just Actually, go back to the last we were hour. just going to get do. into the uh, episode viewing order. Uh, and this is from the Wikipedia. It says, General agreement exists on the first episode and the last two episodes of the 17 Purdue shows. Yeah, but bookends. extensive but. debate has taken place among dedicated fans regarding a correct order for the intermediate 14 episodes. The order in which the episodes were originally broadcast in Britain differs from the order in which they were produced. Even the broadcast order is not that originally intended by series star and co-creator Patrick McGowan. Many have analyzed the series line by line for time references, which in many cases provide different and sometimes radically different episode orders compared to the broadcast order. Oh, one hour. And it goes on to say, 
Ian Rakoff, assistant editor on two episodes and co-writer of Living in Harmony, authored a book in 1998 on his experiences working on the series, wherein the appendices included a numbered episode guide which reflects the original UK broadcast order, as do the nine-volume Laserdisc releases of the series. That would be cool. Also released in 1998. However... The 2006 40th anniversary DVD box set, released in association with American Television's Arts and Entertainment Channel, a &E, uses a different order. The set goes so far as to include a guidebook with justifications for their version, citing, among other reasons, the aforementioned time references, such as number six, telling other members of the village that he is new here the first uk transmission of the first 14 episodes was made by atv and grampian television the final three episodes were first shown in the uk by scottish television and then it talks about unproduced episodes uh the outsider ticket to eternity friend or foe and don't get yourself killed <laughs> and then Good advice it says mm -hmm. uh, in nineteen, uh, sorry, in two thousand seven, a documentary entitled "Don't Knock Yourself Out," produced contain containing behind the scenes footage and archival and newly recorded interviews with the cast and production staff, and it runs approximately ninety minutes. I've never even heard of that. The plot thinnens. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember him saying anything to me about the order of the show. And uh, Tracy, I wasn't sure when yeah. we lost you, but uh, mm -hmm. my friend and fifth wife of Philip K. Dick is here in the chat, mm -hmm. and wow. uh, she says it's a great show, and uh, she's really enjoying the, uh, you know, back and forth. The exchange, we're... the dialogue. The dialogue, the chat, indeed. The banter. Yeah. The information, the <laughs> conversational, the uh, vocabularistics uh, and such like. I would love to talk to her someday about a Philip K. Dick uh, n short story, I believe it was, that we were trying to turn into a, a movie. We spent a lot of time on it. It's been Which a long one? time. I've got to I have to think about That's it. Very it's, interesting. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say, because uh, I don't know when I cut out, uh, the big thing I should probably tell you guys, I almost feel a little guilty talking about it. I did Ooh. gingerly ask him if he could tell me uh, who was number one in his mind. That was really the big question, right? And he gave me a very cryptic kind of coy answer. I think he had fun with answering it, which was, I'm not going to even say that i understood all of it but it was something along the lines of we are all our own worst enemy therefore he implied or the way that i took what he said to me and that this could be my interpretation so i i, I apologize ahead of time i'm not 100 percent sure this is what he meant basically he was saying we all have a number one inside all of us that is battling us at the same time that we're trying to do things in the world. And the implication to me was that number one was always the prisoner. And this whole experience, the surrealistic experience he was having was all part of his dreams. Now he didn't say it in those words, mm -hmm. but it was, that's what he implied in my opinion, that he was dreaming the whole experience as he was battering, as he was battling, excuse me, with I guess what would be called these days his inner id or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's it uh, versus ego. It versus yeah, ego. That's, yeah, that's kind of what I got out of it. And ego I was starting wins. to say, <laughs> I was starting to say to Cardinal when I got cut off, I'm hoping you're a Monty Python fan. Are you? Oh, big time. I think I've heard okay. of his character. Too <laughs> silly. Far too <laughs> silly. More sensible, please. 
the reason that I bring it up is an experience that I had that I equated kind of with the Patrick Stewart one was when I got to spend a day with Michael Palin. And I also got to ask him a million questions you, about you mean Monty the Patrick Python. McGoohan one. Yeah. Yes. It was similar to me because I, say tea, I oh, sort of hot. Sorry. Yeah. You said Patrick Stewart. Oh my God. Did I? That's a Freudian slip. I meant to uh, think of the Patrick yeah. from SpongeBob square paint. <laughs> uh, I had heard that Michael Palin was going to do a quick sort of a cameo on Saturday Night Live when I was there. And when I heard about it, the, the show was getting ready to shoot that day. And I found out that he was going to do this cameo. So I asked around really quickly, was he there? And they said, oh, yeah, he's in dressing room six or whatever. So I went and knocked on the door and figuring that the show was about to shoot, even if he was nice enough to shake my hand, I would only be able to do that and leave. And I knocked on his dressing room door because I'm a huge Python fan. And he was there in New York probably about the same age. I don't remember who that was. And he was incredibly kind. He invited me in. And I got to spend a couple of hours with him. He was saying, like, oh, you mean this one? And then he stood up and he'd repeat the dialogue and stuff. And another case where I never, ever saw him again. And Tracy, we're kind of getting some breakup and you're freezing and your audio is going out. So if you could repeat, that would be oh, great. God, I'm kidding. What is the last thing you heard? Uh, there was, uh, we, pa we missed Patrick the middle Stewart, part about Michael Patrick Palin. McGowan and uh, Patrick from Spongebob okay. Squarepants were all at a party. Okay. Please tell me really quickly. Well, that's exactly what I was saying. Please tell me really quickly if I start to fade out or anything. But you can hear me right now? Will do. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Just saying really quickly, the reason I brought up the Michael Palin thing, I, I'd heard he was going to do a cameo on the show Saturday Night Live when I was there, and we were preparing to do the show that night, so everything's in total turmoil. And I said, is he, is he here yet? I'm a huge Python fan. I would kick myself if I didn't at least shake his hand so I went and I knocked on his door just intending to shake his hand and he was there with a British friend of his they'd come to New York together I don't know what who the other guy was very nice guy and he was incredibly kind he invited me in to his dressing room I ended up spending about two hours with him and what was really killer was I would tell him what some of my favorite sketches were and he would get a big smile on his face and he would jump up and he'd say, oh, you mean this one? And then he'd repeat verbatim the dialogue from that sketch, blowing me away that his memory was so good. And I probably spent about two hours with him. And then I never saw him again, never, no contact after that. So that's why it kind of reminded me of the Patrick Stewart. Pa there, I did it again. The Patrick McGowan thing. <laughs> Too much time at Star Trek. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> very interesting. I'm uh, I'm kind of blown away that you had those two one-hour experiences. That's really cool. So, um, what do you know about the controversial ending of the show, the final episode, and what can you tell us, Tracy, about Leo McKern's uh, mental breakdown or emotional breakdown because of the way uh, Patrick McGoon was dealing with him and the intensity that he was dealing with him with. Okay. I'm sorry, Gil. You're going to have to repeat the end of that because you, you went out. I couldn't hear you. Sure. So my question is, what can you tell us about the controversial ending episode and what can you tell us about the infamous 
intensity with which Patrick McGowan dealt with Leo McKern, and that resulted in Leo McKern having a bit of a nervous breakdown. Oh, he did tell me something about how there was a resistance to getting Leo McKern on the show, and it was because, again, of that famous phrase about being difficult, and he really insisted on it, and he did talk about that. As far as the last uh, episode or two, uh, that was sort of when I got into it with him about who was number one. It's more what I spent my time on, and it sort of segued into what you're asking because it all dealt with the re- quote-unquote reveal in the final, final episode. And my definite interpretation was, again, that uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how he put it, it got into that thing about everyone having to battle their own inner ego. That's really who number one is in everybody. And I think he said something about when the mask is finally pulled off at the end and it's like a laughing monkey, I think, wasn't it? Wasn't that what happened? Um, That was kind of meant as sort of his way of, you know, having a bit of a laugh on, on or with the audience about, it's kind of like, I guess I would equate it like when John Lennon wrote that song, A Glass Onion. You guys know that song? Of course. Remember, there's the line in that song, you know, here's a clue for you all. The walrus was Paul. I think I've seen that uh, John Lennon was just kind of having fun with the fact that everyone was obsessing on what is being a walrus? What does the I am the walrus mean? So he threw in, here's a clue for you all, the walrus was Paul. It didn't have any meaning beyond that. And I Mm -hmm. think that Patrick sort of was, you know, sort of making light of the seriousness with which people were treating the who's the number one, how is the final episode going to end. That was, again, my impression. He he didn't say things that were really 100%, you know, A, one equals, I'm sorry, one plus two equals three. It was, even when you talk to him, he was more sort of talking in allegories a lot of the time, but which de- makes sense when you think about it. Deliberately or otherwise, it's one of the key questions, if not the key question of the, it's basically the prisoner equivalent of is Descartes a replicant? Who is number number one? Is it number six? And so th- then you get into, again, it goes, to, uh, speaks to head canon versus actual intended canon is there an answer that was intended by by patrick i'm not going to say patrick who and then beyond that uh is there uh is it knowable so like with the deckard question the one conclusion rightly or wrongly is there is an answer but we're not going to know it but still there is an answer and so you can't apply head canon you can guess but it's not the answer it's just you will not know the answer and that's maybe that's kind of and patrick's specifically life. with with The Prisoner being a show that was so heavily focused on nonconformism, individualism, and, well, here, I'll just, I'll just play it. I will not make any deals with you. I've resigned. I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. My life is my own. Is it? Yes. You won't hold me. So that's really what the show's core was about. I think that's a very, very important theme, obviously, because he did a whole show about it. But I think that he was angry about a lot of the things he was seeing in the world. And he threw a lot of that anger into the show and the character. Um, Even... Just in that scene, you can see the intensity and the anger in his in his delivery. Captain, what do you think? I think my screen's frozen. Did you really think that? Oh no! Oh, there we go. I think you yeah, just froze up. We can hear there. you again. Can you hear me again? Yes. Yeah. He. <laughs> just comedy for comedy everyone timing. 
just for everyone in the audience, Tracy lives on the top of a mountain and his internet is spotty. So please forgive mm -hmm. occasional dropouts. Very well said. Can you still hear me? Yes. And now we've lost Captain Cockney Spock and we have you. Oh, God, that's a shame. <laughs> uh, I also live at the top of a mountain. I, yeah, I, I very distinctly the remember. Huh. There you are. Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. I just very distinct, distinctly remember asking him if the prisoner character was the John Drake character from. Oh, interesting. From Danger Man. Or Secret Agent, depending on which side of the pond you live on. I totally got. Right. I got the impression that. Oh, you guess you can't hear me again. Uh, we can now. No? Okay. We can now. His answer yes. was... Okay. <laughs> His answer was very much like, oh, do you really think that? And he smiled like, yes, that's the answer. You're right, but I'm not going to say it in words. That was my impression there. That yes, and, the... Uh, and what was, uh, what was the answer? That yes, John Drake, that was the character, but he didn't say it in those words. That was Expressing, definitely like yeah. he, he was amused that people were saying that, but he thought, "Yes, you're right." That that's uh, the impression my, I got again. To my it. mind, of course, it's the John Drake character. Yeah, right. I mean, that's what made him famous. That mm -hmm. was, I mean, he was a huge superstar in the UK and in the United States, and mm -hmm. they offered him the role of James Bond twice and he turned it down mm -hmm. but he recommended his friend Sean Connery for the role who he'd been in Hell Drivers with. Yeah, only declined twice. And it's also... Thank a, God a he... a Sorry. I was, was going to say ahead, it's a bit of a, a meta commentary because in the way that the Drake character was retired then Patrick McGoon was retired and therefore uh, uh, Awaking in the Village is semi-coming out of retirement. So it's a parallel... Uh, to what you were saying, Tracy, about the way that he, he approached uh, uh, developing the show. He didn't want to do another Danger Man. So it's like uh, uh, they're pulling me out. You know, just when I thought I'd quit, they're pulling me out again. So mm -hmm. like his character. Yeah. Very much. I think, that, you know, it's also uh, kind of self-evident, but I think you guys would agree with this, that there was a lot of him personally in the character of the prisoner. And it wasn't just a character he was writing about. I think he put a lot of his own uh, frustrations and uh, intellect into that character. And, you know, he just expressed, I wish, again, that I could um, relate it more eloquently than I probably am. But he really had a, there was very much of a strong sense that he was angry with the world not like angry with the world, like some failures are angry with the world. They say, why doesn't the world ever, you know, give me its uh, treasures? It wasn't like that. He was just angry at the direction of society. And it made him kind of angry that to try to be an individual was getting more and more difficult. And I think that came out for sure all over the prisoner. That's really to me what the prisoner's really all about having spent time with him. I couldn't agree more. And I, I think that again, not to spoil, uh, the show that we're doing reviewing episodes every week because we want the fans to follow along and view on Amazon. If they don't have, their own DVDs or Blu-rays. Um, I think the show itself has to do with the invasion of privacy and mm -hmm. how governments are becoming more involved in the private lives of people. And it does speak to today's internet of things and how you know there are closed camera tv cameras all over the place 
and maybe even in our computers and te televisions. And uh, he was absolutely right. Uh, the the woke culture that we're seeing in television and films that's you know taken over everything and turned it into schlock and uh, is a, yeah. a direct commentary on what he was saying i think don't you tracy mm -hmm. yes i mean i think there are some ways that the prisoner has been prophetic in predicting our future because how many years has it been now since it aired uh what almost 60 about 50 um over 50 yeah 67 yeah Okay, so in some ways it was right about certain things and it wasn't that hard to predict that it would be right. Like maybe the way there would be more surveillance in the future, maybe the rise of sort of a big brother element to government. In those ways, they were, it was certainly prophetic. But there are other ways where I think it was more prophetic in a subtle way. I think, yes. for instance, to most people of today's like millennium, um, generation, if you were to tell them that maybe giving out your social security number on everything you do, what's the big deal about that? That's the way the world works. Well, that's kind of true. But on the other hand, what McGowan was basically saying about the dehumanizing element of reducing people to their serial numbers on most of their daily lives, things they want to do. That I think was very prophetic because I think when it first was, you know, put out in the sixties, people would think, Oh, what a trippy idea. Everyone is reduced to a number instead of a name. Has that come true? I would say largely in some ways. Yes. Absolutely. So, yeah. I remember he's be my mother real telling me when I got my social security card when I was six years old because I was working, uh, handing out milk in the cafeteria at school. She said, this is your social security number. It's for jobs that you work, but it will never be used to track you or mm -hmm. for any other purpose. And make sure that you keep it safe and don't give it out to anyone. And, of course, she was right. That was the original intent. But it's been criminally, in my humble opinion, uh, changed into the reduction of people to a number. Absolutely. Gil, you're going in and out for me. Yeah, I was just saying that what my mom said about social security numbers yeah, has I heard been that part. reduced to, it's been used to reduce people to a number, just like they <laughs> say in the prisoner. That's right. That's right. He's got to be given a lot of credit for that. Um, seems kind of like an obvious thing to say now, but when he said it, it was pretty radical, I think. Yeah, and one of the reasons I think that the prisoner has as much staying power and still is of great interest to people is because it did predict a lot of the things that we've been talking about in society mm -hmm. that Patrick McGowan was so angry about, about the invasion of privacy of the individual and the reduction of the individual to a number and that's so evident and the way that he gets it across in the series in the episodes where there's the psychedelic elements and they're trying to get into his mm -hmm. head and get into mm -hmm. his mind and things like that really prophetic for our day well guys how about this one because this one is very profound to me the way that language is being used and abused today. I've never mm -hmm. seen a time in my, my life where things are being said that really don't have sense behind it, but if it gets uh, as a means to the end, it works. I'm not gonna try to get too much into politics, but as an example, kind of a mundane example, here in the United States, we have something called an 
infrastructure bill for trillions of dollars. Now, if you look at it, there's maybe six million dollars or something like that on infrastructure that really is infrastructure. The rest of it is something totally different. But if it's called infrastructure, people will say, yeah, I'm for that. I'm for infrastructure. That's yeah, rebuilding who, roads. for infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah. You rebuild roads and old bridges. I'm for that. Now, you might say, gee, that's kind of people are misunderstanding what it is. But that's not accidental at all. It's a way of, of seditiously being able to raise, you know, six trillion dollars or whatever it is for all of your pet projects. But as long as you call it infrastructure, people will support it. Anyway, my point is that's being done more these days than I think ever in history. It's being used like. There's a massive amount of pork in that infrastructure bill. Well, put it this way, 20 years ago, we had the, the largest rollout of domestic surveillance of its own people by the government in history, mm. and they called it the Patriot mm. Act. If they called it the Domestic Fascism <laughs> Act, it wouldn't yep. have passed, but they called it the Patriot <laughs> right. Bill. Everyone's all for it. But it was basically... And here Citizens you go, United, idiots. it's all yeah, he, Orwellian. If they, if they actually and who's were, the most were honest, they, they would have called it, here you go, idiots, here's your domestic... Uh, we're going <laughs> to spy on you, Domestic Fascism Bill, and you're going to pay for it. Here's the bill for the bill. And who's the most fascist group going down and doing fascistic, fascistic things? It's Antifa. And what does Antifa stand for? Anti-fascist. So they are actually anti-fascist, but they're going to do fascist things all over the place. All my yep. point is it's not to get into left versus right. What I'm trying to say is language is absolutely being weaponized. Totally all over the world yeah, as a matter so of fact, that you if you call something something the edge of time says yeah. no patriot would support the patriot act amen and mm -hmm. you know i started out as a classic liberal a lefty me too and now too. i'm kind of a centrist me and too i i don't really agree I'm with the same, but Let's say the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm a double extremist, same but different. I'm, yeah, I'm a <laughs> moderate extremist. I actually, my official voting status is unaffiliated, and I huh. still get calls and email and texts from the Democratic Party, from which I immediately yeah. unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, well, I take your my, point, my, Tracy. It's, yeah, my. It's, my my family has been intertwined with democratic politics all of my life. My aunt was a state senator in Nevada, about as liberal as you can get. And my dad was very close with Tom Bradley, who was the mayor of Los Angeles, and uh, he sang for JFK and stuff. So we've been we've known all the democratic power brokers for many years, Harry Reid and people like that, but. I don't know what the Democrats have morphed into because it's, you know, actually makes me think we are heading down a very bad path. But my, my major point was Orwell used to talk about the use of language to control people, to dominate people. And language is being so insidiously used now. And I guarantee you that's something Patrick's uh, Patrick, McGowan would have totally appreciated and, and recognized. And it was where he was very prophetic about it. I reckon it is the NSA this time. Yeah, he's actually saying something with it. Uh, so he used we, language we lost in the you, series. Tracy, for about 20 seconds. Can you repeat? That happens every time I ask him to repeat. He freezes up again. It is weird timing, eh? See, there's, there's, where's our infrastructure? The bill should be spent on decent. It's same with New Zealand. Where's our internet, you fuckers? Yeah, everyone should have fiber. 
on 130. Your fiber, our normal broadband would be good. Just rely four megabits per second on a good day. Come on, Jacinda, start <laughs> investing. Stop spying, start investing. I think we have Tracy back. back? Tracy will ask back, you guys? for about a minute. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly say this, and I don't want to be redundant about it, but I absolutely feel the weaponization of language now as sort of a political weapon against people that disagree with you or as a way to get things you really want by masking it, by giving it a phrase uh, that doesn't really fit it as long as it'll work and get support. I think that is classic prisoner stuff. That is maybe mm -hmm. to me the, the biggest way that the prisoner has been uh, prophetic is that we now live in an age where some of the most ridiculous Orwellian uh, uses of language have become commonplace. I think it's not only unfortunate, I think it's highly, highly dangerous. If you have an enemy that you really want to subdue, I'm not talking about in a technical warfare, but in, you know, in social warfare, there's someone you want to destroy if you come up with the proper use of language to attack them or what they stand for, it's going to work. And it's also going to turn people into some violent rages against them. And I think that is right out of the prisoner my, myself. That's my opinion. I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, the chat uh, tip it. of the hat again to Orwell, the, the language uh, issue that you mentioned is, uh, very prevalent uh, in the the naming of bills and things like that by government since, gosh, mm -hmm. probably since your dad sang for JFK. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's right. It's it's getting worse and worse, uh -huh. and the creep is becoming more of a oh, he's a out moving control. scenery that he's you can signing executive orders every day. Yeah, it's not subtle at all anymore. What's going to what's going to be really interesting guys as we all go into the future hopefully for many years um is society as a whole going to be brave enough to do what the John Drake character did? Are they going to be brave enough to stand up for things they believe in even if they're not popular in today's society? Um if someone who knows they're, they've never been a racist, takes a position and is up. Days, because no one wants to be called that. Uh, or are we, they going to have the guts? We lost you, Tracy. We lost oh. you just after yeah. if someone isn't a racist. Yes. If someone is called a racist or a white supremacist and they know that they are not, most of the time these days I would opine that people just shrink into the background and they're so scared about being tarnished with those phrase phrases, especially if they know it's not true. Their way of dealing with it is to acquiesce, okay? And that would be like the prisoner caving in and saying, okay, Here's who I am. Here's how I resigned. But if they stand up to this sort of uh, Lord of the Flies type of turn that society has taken to them, then they will really be doing it in the true spirit of the John Drake character. That's my opinion. Um, so I feel that those kind of issues are more... See, we lost guys. You can you hear me? You said those kinds <laughs> of issues are more <laughs> okay. Those kind of issues are more uh, re relevant. Relevant. Well, I can't speak anymore. Relevant. They relevant. are more re relevant. relevant. They are more relevant yeah. today than certainly at any time in my life. 
And it's sort of the darker part of the prisoner, unfortunately, in my opinion, is more um, relevant again to society as a whole today than it ever has been. And that's by a mile to me. And if people are going to fight back against some of the group think and some of the Lord of the Flies uh, dangers that are out there, they're going to be kind of like symbolically like the prisoner standing up against, you know, the, the powers on the island, number one and number two. It's going to be interesting to see if people... I think you make a very are- good point about will individuals in society have the bravery to stand up against the surveillance capitalism that's taken over and the 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 way that this language has been used that you mentioned has made it so if people try to defend themselves and say no i'm not a racist immediately ah that's a dead giveaway you are a racist that's right yeah that's exactly right and and so the question is how will people be able to fight back against this uh, this oppression while language is used against them so that if they try to defend themselves individually rather than as a group i think was your point uh Mm -hmm. it's almost impossible I think we need to uh, understand a response. Anytime someone goes, you're a racist, just go, no, I just don't like The Last Jedi. What? Because, <laughs> I mean, and having and, said that, many a true word spoken in jest, you know, Disney's response to criticism of The Last Jedi was to have their PR department label the people that didn't like The Last Jedi as toxic racist. Fans. That, that yeah. actually did happen. And that's, and yeah, by that's, the that's way, demonstrable. You know, I Stephen wanted Cole to Baird mention... Didn't. Tracy, yes. that uh, yes, I'm here. Tessa, Tessa Dick, in our uh, chat says mm-hmm. JFK was a conservative by today's standards. Absolutely true. And Michael Beacom says to Tessa, "Yes, a friend of mine who loves JFK has been saying that for a couple of presidential administrations now." And also says to Tessa. I helped him run down Dallas witnesses and facts about JFK's assassination about 10 years. And after about 10 years, we had to conclude it was just one lone nut with a gun. Kennedy was so revered that many reject. And Yvette says, I'm not a number. Oh, wait, I am. It's called the new COVID passport. Oh, there you go, you see. That's Very good perfect example. Yeah. Fuck yeah. the passport. That's what I say. <laughs> um, about this idea of groupthink and the dangers of the Lord of the Flies philosophy that I was talking about. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Real quickly. I hope I'm getting this name right. John Kelly, I believe he's an ex astronaut. He became the Senator in Arizona. I think he's now running for re-election. Does anyone, and there's a reason I'm bringing him up. Does anyone know who he is? The name rings a bell. Yeah. Anyway, he was in England. This is how I was told the story. And he was talking about his great admiration for Winston Churchill and all the things he did to defeat Nazism and win. Because how can you say good things okay. about a known you, We race? lost you oh. right mm-hmm. when you said all the things Winston Churchill did to defeat Nazism. Okay. So he was praising him and his resolute backbone in fighting the Nazis. Well, all of a sudden there was a firestorm the next day on the internet. And they were all over Kelly savaging him. How in the world can you say good things about such a racist and a colonist and a sexist and a smoker as Winston Churchill. That helped us win the war without 
any doubt, Winston Churchill was American and British and came along exactly when the UK needed him, yep. England specifically, and well, uh, Kelly was Kelly, can you guys was the backbone that was necessary. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 The only reason the only reason I brought this up, Kelly spent the next week or two prophetically apologizing. Oh my God, I didn't realize he was all those things, and I'm so sorry I said it, and I'll never say it again. It was the most whimpering, cowering apology I've ever seen. And when I saw that, I thought, he has to apologize when he's in England and praises Winston Churchill? And it wasn't just that he apologized, it was that he was genuflecting to, to please beg forgiveness from everybody for what he'd said. And is what he do said that, that bad? With the mob, <laughs> you always right. lose. That's yeah. so true. And that's what Patrick was really saying, in my opinion, about standing up to number one. You know what I mean, guys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, the number yeah. one, whether it's internal or external. Mm hmm. But it's not just, you know, fighting number one, but it's also a dangerous trend in the world that again i would say echoes the darker elements of the prisoner it's a dangerous time because a lot of people are backing up their opinions and their politics with a lot of violence and so you know that that's also a part of the prisoner um anyway yeah, absolutely yeah and and the further into the future we go to kind of uh, continue walking in the metaphor that you were using the mm -hmm. the more this creep of authoritarianism uh, versus individualism continues and Amen. that is so prophetic from the prisoner mm -hmm. uh, most people don't even see it or if they That's read right. about it like on Facebook or something they just don't really get it and the people that you were talking about, the, the millennial generation, it's just part of life. It's how they mm -hmm. were raised. And mm -hmm. they don't That's understand right. that there used to be a time when there was no World Wide Web. And we read books and we had phones, but Ooh. they were landlines attached to our walls. And but if, it's you also the, to, the... if you wanted to write a, a mail to somebody, you had to do it on paper and send it in the mm -hmm. mail. It's and also the parent, the parents and the teachers of the oh, millennial absolutely. generation but that are totally the technology. To blame and I think this speaks to the speaks to the prisoner specifically, the technology that we have today that we consider so convenient. You know, you can look up anything on Google and, you don't have oh, to that, read that the Encyclopedia Britannica or anything like that. Mm -hmm. The more these conveniences pop up and the more apps that people have on their phone, things like that, they don't mm -hmm. realize that that's just the front end. The back end is all about collecting data on your personal life, what your interests are, what, what you buy, what you read, and this is all being sold and the government's okay with it because they, you know, both the Democrats and the Republicans have the same donors. There's one word that comes to mind for what you just said, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Insidious. That's what it is for me. It's insidious. Um, but it's reality. It is reality. Yeah, it's a good word for it. Very true. Mm -hmm. Insidious reality, quite right. Yeah, what is really your thoughts? Well, it's uh, the prisoners uh, become true. I mean, it's already been an influence mm -hmm. in my life. I'm I'm living in the village right now, but in the meanwhile, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it it is ahead of its time. It is more relevant than ever, and uh, uh, I, what a great bit of timing uh, to, uh, that we're going to be reviewing it because I think we're going to be uh, rewatching it, and uh, I suspect I'm going to be watching these episodes in whichever order going. This is more about today's world than it ever was. <laughs> mm -hmm. So true. Good one, Dar 
Good one, Darius. I am not a millennial. I'm not Generation X. I'm a free man. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's a double-edged sword, guys, because some of the, the darker elements of the prisoner are coming true. On the other hand, it makes it very relevant to re-examine it from today's perspective. It does. And Definitely. speaking to what you were saying earlier uh, about the uh, individualism being, you know, especially with the social security number, the government reducing people to a number, it was so mm -hmm. prophetic of the prisoner. And now it's gotten even worse. Now, because of the Internet of Things, and, and just the way that social media has invaded our lives and our individuality, uh, it's, it, it is insidious. Now they know all these things. And that huge uh, data center that they built in Utah is being filled with every single phone call, every single text message. And then eventually, when AI becomes sufficiently advanced, they will glean all the information they need from keywords and machine learning and all that kind of thing to be able to focus exactly on what this conservative person wants, what this liberal person buys, what mm -hmm. interests you know you have when you get books from the library or what you rent from the video store or especially online if you're watching things on Amazon or other streaming services that's all being you know processed and data is being used against you mm -hmm. so true so true and I think that's really the lesson that I take home from the prisoner and I think if I'm not overstepping my bounds maybe you guys can tell me i think that's kind of the lesson that we're supposed to take home from the prisoner what do you think it's a good it's a good one and i also think the prisoner is kind of like a rorschach test for every individual that watches it um hmm. everyone pretty much takes something slightly different out of it and that's part of the brilliance of it in my opinion Captain? Yep, you can project your own theories onto it. And that's why I like the idea that uh, uh, basically in the uh, 40 intervening years since I last uh, watched it properly, well, that's not true, I watched it again a couple of years ago. But basically that's the whole thing. Every time I watch it, it hasn't changed. I have, and so has the world. And so this is mm. exactly the same program. It's the same DVDs. And yet it uh, appears different to me because I uh, it's basically the lesson, yeah, the lesson in 12 Monkeys. Uh, the show doesn't change, but you do. So, yeah, every couple of years, mm. it's a different one. And therefore, uh, I look forward to the latest review because, uh, uh, yeah, the world has changed so drastically in even the last two two or so years since I have indeed watched The Entire Prisoner. It's been a long time since I've watched The Prisoner. And this, uh, what we've done today, is really whetting my appetite to revisit it again. It's been a long time. Amen. Especially with the remastered versions uh, with the surround sound and mm -hmm. being in HD and in 1080p or maybe even in 4K now, I don't know. On Amazon, it looks like it was made yesterday. It really does. Okay, and that's great. The, the, what uh, Captain Cockney Spock was talking about is exactly on point. The show hasn't changed, but it reflects today's society better and better the further we go and the more mm -hmm. we change with reacting to all the changes in the internet and and social engineering the more topical it becomes and yes it whets my appetite too and one of the things about this show that i'm really looking forward to with captain cockney spock as the co-host is watching these sh episodes of The Prisoner, these 17 episodes, 
and discussing the implications not only of its time in 1967, but its future predictions and how they've come true and the meaning of the reflection against the society that we're living in today. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right on the money. Well, can anyone disagree with that? Definitely. Mm-hmm. And then on top of well, that, we've got it. A... Sorry, go on. No, that's okay. I was just going to ask you guys. I know Gil and I spoke briefly about this. Did anyone see the remake, quote unquote, miniseries, The Prisoner? I saw Ooh. the first episode and I didn't watch any more. It was absolutely a perversion, had nothing to do with the prisoner. It was just a, a product. I would say, and I mean this literally, unwatchable. Impossible yes. to watch. You talk about taking something so good and taking all the good things of it out and focusing on something else. I don't even know, God, what they focused on. I was so disappointed because being the fan I am, I saw there's a mini series coming on. I couldn't wait to see what did they do with it now using modern CGI and things. What are they going to find, you know, for the village? Where are they going to set it? I think I lasted about an hour and I was not only bored, but I was really angry because it was a monstrosity in my opinion. I wonder if anyone out in the audience saw it and didn't hate it. Cause I'd really be curious to see if there's anyone out there. That feels I'd be that very way. surprised if that were the mm-hmm. case. The edge of time wow. has an interesting question. Any thoughts on the penny farthings as a symbol? I hear you need an umbrella in Port Marion. Oh, it was a great I iconic visual for the show right i mean it's so strange looking and uh it looks futuristic even though it's actually ancient i guess in some ways um so it's pretty brilliant but uh whether it really symbolizes anything else i'm not sure but it, i thought it was a pretty brilliant device for branding the show mm-hmm. agree it's almost like uh, the penny farthing almost represents uh, the, the prisoner. You see a penny farthing, you think one of two things, hipster or the prisoner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm. I think, and again, I want to bounce this off of both of you guys and get your opinion because this is going to shape how we approach the next 17 weeks watching these episodes and reviewing them. Mm-hmm. The the struggle between the internal and the external that I think Tracy, you were saying that Patrick McGoon was vaguely addressing in Mm -hmm. the question of who is number one, Mm -hmm. when he sort of laughed or chuckled, uh, and that your inference was that the struggle was between Internally, the id and the ego, and externally, yes. Yes. between individualism and this creep of society, mm-hmm. the government and the corporations uniting forces and coming after us, sort of. Um, which of the two is the most important in reference to the prisoner and? Which of the two is the most important for us going forward? Mm. And either one of you can start. Well, uh, okay, I'm going to say good, good mind reading because I was just thinking the same thing that uh, Tracy touched upon the fact that maybe the whole thing is indeed a dream, uh, something going on in the prisoner's head. And uh, that makes me think of uh, Brazil, for example, uh, or indeed uh, a scanner, not a scanner, dark blue Freudian slip, a uh, wrong Philip K. Dick. Mm. Uh, we can remember it for you wholesale, uh, a.k.a. Um, what's that film? Total Recall. Almost couldn't recall the title of Total Recall. <laughs> and so, so first of all, the idea that it could be a dream. But then further to that, the idea that we don't. In- that we don't we don't let ourselves understand that, I think, is what he was about to say. 
Mm -hmm. But let's find out. Got to say, Go the ahead. NSA have got an excellent sense of humor. Good timing, guys. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, guys, can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Excellent. So yeah, so the idea there is uh, not only the uh, the question of uh, is it a dream, but even then more specifically, is it intended as a dream? As you said quite rightly, Cardinal Sin, implication versus inference. And then so how privileged are we to have you, Tracy, who's actually had the privilege of speaking to the actual auteur behind the whole thing. And then that gets into uh, auteur theory versus death of the author. So do we even count the views of Patrick extracurricular to the show so is it a dream is it real is it both are we supposed to know is it a head canon or is there a definite canon is there an answer to the question is there an answer that we'll never discover so is there meant to question. be an answer right so i'm already fascinated brilliant cardinal spot on questioning it's a good uh, good framing device <laughs> for the show it's an allegory for politics and also it could be literally a journey into his own mind i mean we don't know mm. so fascinating stuff going in I think that he implied that it was a journey into his own mind. That's a good way to put it. And yeah, and is it um, a, is it a dream? I certainly feel real. I, I certainly felt another impression that I got from him was there are no definitive answers. Everything is open to interpretation depending on the individual. It's pretty much what he said. Not necessarily using those exact words, but he sort of said with kind of a laugh or two, you know, And Michael Beacom says, uh, regarding the remake of The Prisoner, would have to improve just to be garbage. It was made by people who have no idea what the original was about. So there you go, Tracy. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the beginning of that. Could you read it again? Yeah. The remake of The Prisoner would have to improve just to be garbage. It was made by people who have no idea what the original was about. Sub garbage. Yeah. Who, yeah. who wrote that? Uh, that was Michael Beacon. Who said that? Gil? He's totally Michael right. Beacom. We totally agree. Yeah, we totally agree. Uh, and now, if anyone has never seen it, it's worth seeing just to see how hideous it is. I'm not exaggerating. It's almost like uh, I'm curious to watch it. It's like wh whichever direction they're going in, go the opposite. Whatever they missed, focus it, on the it, things they didn't. It didn't have in. a direction. <laughs> it was woke bullshit. It didn't okay. have a story. Yeah. It, was it was all just over the place and went nowhere. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Okay. Anything you saw that you liked about the prisoner has been removed from the remake. It's just not even in there. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's absolute. I mean, sort of in name only. I mean, there are characters number six, number two, but it's. Mm you know, like a lot of the woke garbage that is, has infected our pop culture, uh, it it was, you know, it was a placeholder only. And that's not entertainment. Being lectured to about <laughs> identity politics and all this kind of thing, that's not why mm -hmm. we watch good storytelling. And we watch good storytelling as escapism so that we don't yeah. have to think about uh, what's going on or in the case of sliders and great shows like Star Trek and, and uh, the Twilight Zone and sliders, it's escapism into reality. It makes us think about what the insidiousness of what's going on really is. And I've mentioned to you before, Tracy, one of my favorite lines from Sliders was when they slide in and there are a bunch of hippies sitting around <laughs> and they ask someone, who's the president? And the hippie replies, Oliver North, man. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, uh, now I've got myself curious. Does anyone know who the 
create now i'm curious we we, we lost ahead. you when you said oh, does anyone sorry. know who the creator who were the creative forces behind the prisoner remake was i was so disillusioned with it i don't think i even looked at the credits does anyone know who who did it what production company what yeah i don't either uh spider's I fan do. blog uh says mm -hmm. haha summer of love episode <laughs> yeah that was, was our their first stuff. uh yeah it was our first show after the pilot a personal favorite of mine too and i have to say tracy i i know that we're supposed to be focusing on the prisoner but there are a lot of similar themes in sliders to the prisoner it's not and not an accident Right. And yeah. that was back when you had to make an appointment with television. It didn't make an appointment with you. <laughs> and so well, I watched Sliders religiously every week because it was such a great vehicle. Instead of taking the wagon train to the stars, you take a wormhole to the same planet. It's just a <laughs> different parallel universe or reality and i loved it and uh Thank that's you. why you're one of my favorite writers showrunners creators i love it Thank you. and there are a lot of people not just in the chat but that i run into on youtube all the time that can't stop talking about sliders and i really think that your reimagining or continuation or reboot of sliders is going to be very successful it's going to be a kind of a, a mind blower for that this generation that's like i said got their nose in their phone uh and just kind of accepts everything that's on tv whether it has a story to it or not thank you gil uh, i promise you that if you notice similarities in some sliders episodes to the prisoner, I promise you that was never an accident. I, I think prisoner influenced me at Star Trek too. I, I wrote an episode called the Royale and it wasn't exactly what I tried to do. It actually went far astray and I ended up taking my name off it and they used a pseudonym, but originally it was a slight, a, a prisoner, inspired episode where uh, the Star Trek people end up on a planet where they find a strange hotel called the Royale and all the people there are trapped and trying to get out of it and a mysterious hotel manager runs the hotel so there's number one and the hotel is the island and it was absolutely mm -hmm. derivative of the prisoner and it ultimately, it got changed so much that I put one of my two pseudonyms on it. So that dream of doing a prisoner homage on Star Trek never took place. It did in the you original script. You had to pull script. a Cordwainer bird. Oh, that's exactly right. Yes, good old Harlan, old friend of mine. Yes, yeah. very true. I would have loved to have but, met Harlan. Well, I, I regret Harlan's death more than ever now because I don't think I had a personal friend that was more angrily anti-UFO than Harlan. And he not oh, only really? this he not only despised everything about UFOs, but he absolutely felt it was a hundred percent nonsense. There was never a real sighting, there was never a real encounter, and you have to be a lunatic to buy into that stuff. And sometimes when something interesting in the UFO world would go on and I'd be so tempted to just poke the hornet's ne nest, so I would call Harlan about it, he w would not even let me get a sentence out of my mouth because he was just, you know, devastatingly anti-UFO, as was Gene Roddenberry, by the way, amazingly. So I didn't know that. They 
yeah, they would both have a tough time with what's going on in the world now because it's only a matter of time before the whole world has to accept that it's really going on. And my opinion. as a further announcement, not just mm. about the show that we're doing, I Am Not a Number, the review show, The Prisoner, but we're looking forward to having you on, Tracy, on a episode of Into the Fringe where we can really do a deep dive into your work into UFOs and uh, just the UFO topic entirely. That sounds great, Gil. It's a great time to do that. Much more going on than sort of a sleeping world realizes. But like I said, I think it's only a matter of a few years before it's all going to burst like a dam or something. Um, so it's a good time to talk about that. I remember one of the quotes on the back of one of Bud Hopkins' books, either Missing Time or Intruders, was mm -hmm. something that struck me. And it was, quote, the future will be a place for only the young and the strong, unquote. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder who said that. It was one of the abductees. Mm, really? That that was that's, that's you know in the book. That's fascinating, and I know we're not talking about UFOs here, but I'll just quickly say anyone who's familiar at all with abductions as a phenomenon, that is so out there, so science fiction y by its very nature. For the longest time I just didn't want to talk about it even though I probably have more experience in abductions than any other part of ufology, but that's also going to come out into the light pretty soon, in my opinion. And once that becomes looked at seriously or even accepted by some people, it's going to really uh, open some dark doors, I'm sorry to say. But it's fascinating at the same time. And, of course, uh, maybe not as famously as it should be, you wrote The Phenomenon, correct? Yeah, uh, I, it was my film originally. And then the other guy that I partnered with uh, and I had a falling out. And now I don't really talk about it. But, yes, it started off as me and him. And then I basically walked off the project. And it ended up not what I had wanted. So that's that's as far as I'll go. Because if I mm -hmm. say more, I'll be threatened with a million lawsuits. Right. As has happened. Um, so there you go. Slider's fan blog says, mm -hmm. I've seen a UFO and people say take a photo. I was so fixed on it. It was the last thing on my mind. And I will uh, echo that. Uh the last UFO that I saw, the last two, mm -hmm. actually, um, it took place so quickly and at night that I was holding, you know, a bag of groceries in each hand. And I was mm -hmm. about to step onto my porch to enter my house. And I looked up and I saw what, if I recounted now, would sound quite absurd. Ooh. Uh, and later it hit me how absurd it was and mm. there's sort of a almost a a double take not in the regular sense but after thinking about it it was almost like it was a a show put on for my benefit because nobody else could possibly have seen it and i only saw it for maybe 5 seconds and if i mm. dropped my groceries and run to the other side of the house it it would have been gone and I, I would have gotten if anything just a blurry light on my iPhone so I'll echo that sentiment of well, it's the last thing on your mind mm -hmm. if you're in that Oz effect where you're just stunned or if well, you're actually well, thinking well, about it sometimes it's just not feasible what was absurd about it uh so the sighting I've talked about before on 
Into the Fringe, uh, my UFO slash paranormal show that I do on Thursdays from 7 to 9 p.m. Central here on the Cardinal Sin channel. And uh, it was two, at what I initially thought were planes. They looked like planes, except they were much bigger. And they were moving very organically, like lovebirds. So they would come very close together, and then they would move apart, and then they would come very close together, and then move apart. And I mean, I mean, within like a degree of each other. Planes at an air show would never get that close to each other. And this was done not by the Blue Angels, but by something that literally looked like and many witnesses will will tell you this and tracy i don't have to tell you this that upon reflection on their sighting many people will say it was absurd it you know it, it was a show for me there was no one else around when they choose to show themselves instead of you know, only being detectable in the infrared or whatever, uh, when they do choose to show themselves, it's often like it's a display put on for the benefit of the viewer. I think that's that's very, you know, smart for you to think that. I think that's true. And I'm envious of you because I've been looking at the skies all my life since I've been interested in this, and I've never seen anything that I think I couldn't finally explain so if you saw something like that, it's a blessing, in my opinion, just to witness it. Hmm. It is. And and it's not the only sighting or experience that I've had. And I won't mm. go into them here. Okay. But uh, on the episode, when you join us for Into the Fringe, I'd be happy to talk about them again. Great. I'd like to hear it. I'd um, like to hear it. But... Uh, the, the interesting thing is there are people that are believers and there are people that are non-believers like Harlan. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I have the privilege of knowing. I don't have to believe or disbelieve or... You, you know, know what you saw. Yeah, I know what I saw. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't... I didn't know what they were. I can't tell you what they were, obviously, just like any other UAP or UFO. But I know it wasn't anything that commonly flies around the skies of planet Earth. I tell you what, Cardinal, I, that you just give me a thought because uh, I've got uh, very little practical to contribute to a UFO conversation. But actually linking in UFOs and the prisoner, you've done me a favor. You just made me realize because I'm... As you know, I'm currently obsessed with the, the whole the whole central premise, the promise of fiction, which is suspension of disbelief, internal canonical mm. very similitude. And whether the question is mm. uh, is the prisoner dreaming or is Descartes a replicant, it always goes back to uh, it's not a headcanon. There is an actual reality, and but, mm -hmm. but increasingly people are going it's fiction. It's like yeah, I know it's fiction, but now I'm thinking. Mm. As with all online arguments, you think, okay, that's a silly argument. Think, well, let's let's face that. So, okay, it's fiction. Let's apply the concept of suspension of disbelief to non-fiction. And Cardinal, you you guys, you both have just Tracy and Cardinal. Thank you. You just made me realise mm. UFO sightings are a perfect example. So, if we uh, forget the question for just for a moment: Is Descartes a replicant, mm. or is the prisoner actually happening? The question could be. Did Cardinal mm. see a UFO? So here's an idea <laughs> from the world of actual reality, where like Cardinal, mm -hmm. you're my friend, so I know that you're you're telling the truth, but that's already the first barrier. People that don't know you go, well, you're fibbing. Or they might go, well, you're telling the truth, but you didn't see what you think you saw. So here's now well, as an example. He believes what he thinks he saw. Right. He believes it. He's telling the truth as far as he, as knows. he knows it. Yeah. But but what did he actually see? So thank you guys, because you know the topic of UFO is now for those of you when I'm talking about Deckard or Star Trek or the prisoner go, Oh, it's fiction. Well, now we can apply the question to actual reality. So it's the same mm. thing. It's like 
you saw something. I don't know what you saw because I wasn't there, but I'm not going to go headcanon about it. And that's a lesson for me, not pro to project mm. my own prejudices, opinions, beliefs, desires. I wish you would see an alien because I think it'd be exciting. So the lesson for me, whether it's fiction or fact, is to listen, learn, and be a detective about it. So thank and you. I was especially careful to pay attention when I saw this happening because it was a fleeting moment. It was only a few seconds, but rather than drop the groceries and get my phone out and get the camera <laughs> app going and then miss it, I decided to be as present in the moment as I possibly could. And then mm. when I came in, I put the grocery bags down and instead of putting them away, I immediately fired up my computer and wrote exactly what happened so that mm. I would have a permanent record of it. And because memory is fallible and yes. when we look back on things, it changes. Like for instance, when I reflected on how absurd it was, I think I even mentioned it when I wrote it, you know, down, but it's important to get your thoughts collected at that moment. If, mm -hmm. if yes. I'd love, I'd, I'd love to hear your original impressions of what you saw. Um, well, I can read it to you. you and yeah. I'd be happy to, to do that on, uh, yeah. on our into the fringe episode. Um, I'd like, I'd like to Michael hear that. Beacom says uh, at Cardinal sin regarding UFOs, my friends and I have argued about this for a while. We think the village demonstrated alien technology. I mean, hmm. Rover? That kind of biotech from an Earth lab? Sure. <laughs> but all, the two topics are more linked than we realized. And Lighter's <laughs> fan blog says, the Rendlesham Forest binary code notes basically came to the same conclusion. It was us from the future. Uh-oh. Hmm. Well, one of the Ed, things Edge we'll of get Time into. says, for me, the feeling yeah. of being observed separates the genuine sightings from the random aerial phenomena. Like I'm being mm -hmm. watched. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm on YouTube, I get the feeling I'm being watched. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. That's very prisoner like, isn't it? Very much so. And <laughs> as we get ready to wrap up, I wanted to ask both of you. Uh, any thoughts that you had uh, regarding any of the things that we've discussed uh, and of course uh, wanted to give both of you an opportunity to plug uh, anything that you want to plug so in any order you choose okay well I'll, I'll jump in first um, I think what this has brought out this conversation has reminded me how much how you know fertile the ground of the prisoner is there's so many things to consider and when i think back on it i'm sure i'm going to be you know continuously surprised by each episode i'm, I'm certainly there are things of course i will remember and other things will seem like i'm seeing them for the first time so i'm excited to go through them again hopefully i'll have the time to do that as much as i can um but uh i think there's a lot to look at um as far as for me individually, you guys know I was working on the Sliders review, Reboot. And also I'm just very, very involved with Lou Elizondo and his. That would be the ATIP organization, I think. Um, last story. I we was we last lost you there, uh, Tracy. You, you were last saying that you were involved with Lou Elizondo. And he came over the other day and said he had a UFO video to show me. And I thought, oh God, here comes a fuzzy light in the sky that I've seen mm -hmm. a million times. And instead he showed me something that was jaw dropping. It was pretty amazing. Taken was by his the, father. The, the mirror ball? No, it's never really been seen in, except in small parts of the country chile because that's where he mm -hmm. took it he his father took a shot of this thing in santiago chile just a couple of days ago and uh it's hard to even describe I, I don't see how anyone can look at this and come up with any other explanation other than that's a legitimate ufo so i'm just starting to 
disseminate it to the world, to the people that I know would be most interested in it. And these things are happening a lot now. Uh, did you guys hear the it's, recent report by the Navy? Uh, please tell us. I'll just tell you quickly. I don't want to spoil this for the other show, but the Navy being compelled to report these things now by the by Congress, they said they've recently explored 144 reports of UAPs. I think it's over the last year. 143 of them were unexplained. There wow. was one that was explained. It was a balloon. 143 unexplained. And that's being told to us by the Navy, not by UFO freaks. So mm -hmm. pretty interesting time. And that's a big distinction. Uh, Captain, do you want to plug your channel? I'd love to, because I'm gagging for that magic 250 subscribers. Then I know I'm going to hit the big time. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, uh, I guess it's uh, more of this, but without the prisoner. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, a lot of channels go on about uh, pop culture, as do we. But rather than spending 15 hours a day talking about the current mm. status of Kathleen Kennedy's contract, although we do touch mm. upon it, as I am now, we're more about the, the going through the, the pyramid, up the pyramid, through the story, out the other side, into the actual yeah. structure of the story. So things like, as Darius pointed out, author theory versus death of the author. Uh, certainly, uh, especially this month, we're obsessed with internal, canonical, very similitude, uh, whether it's Star Wars, Star Trek, or Doctor Who. I really, I'm all about the suspension of disbelief. I want to believe in the reality of the story that I'm following in, so I can have a nice little laugh or a lot, nice little cry. And therefore, yeah. if the, uh, basically what you were saying, uh, what you guys were touching upon earlier, if the creators of a TV show or a movie don't care, and I do, then, uh, well, that's why I've got the channel. So, yeah, being passionate and really mm -hmm. caring about the inner reality of IPs, that and knob jokes, that's our channel. That's great. I, I love good. the sound of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, Captain Cockney Spock is not only a good friend of mine, but a very intelligent, uh, thoughtful, reasoned, uh, creative that I've enjoyed working with over the last year or so. And too kind, Carl, very I much, think. very much look forward to working with on uh, I Am Not a Number this show which will continue in this time slot uh wednesdays from 3 to 5 p.m uh central and i can't wait to dig into the prisoner watch yes. these new remastered versions that really do look like they were made yesterday they they sound mm -hmm. fantastic mm -hmm. and as we've all been talking about over the last two hours are more topical today than probably when they were made in 1967. Mm -hmm. mm. It's been in a real fact, pleasure. Sorry, quick, yeah. Yes, I was going to say, quick closing thought. I just want to thank both of you because you've gotten me live on air, got me more and more excited as if I wasn't already to rewatch The Prisoner. And so that, that is chef's kiss because that's what it's all about. You know, rather than just <laughs> complaining about the IPs we don't like, about getting passionate about the ones that we do like and sharing that with hopefully not just an existing, but a new audience. So thank you both for reigniting my passion. That is priceless. Thank you both. Thank you guys. It's and been really, really interesting. And it's been an absolute honor, Tracy, to have you on. And I really look forward to uh, the next time that we can talk. Thank you, Gil. I think we're doing the uh, UFO subject in on Thursday, right? Uh, I think we're going to be sometime in October. Oh, okay. Good enough. But we are going to reschedule Masters of the Genre so that we can finish our interview about sliders. And we'll mm -hmm. have PJ on and Mark Scott Zacree. Boy, we're going to have a great time. That'll be a lot of fun, guys. Thank you so much for everything. We'll talk soon, all of you guys, okay? Sounds good. Amen, brother. Bye-bye. And you thanks too. for everybody in the chat being here. Nothing without thanks, everybody. For yeah. Tracy Torme, 
And Thank Captain you. Cockney Spock, it's Cardinal Sin, out. <laughs>